Hello and welcome to the Washington Urban Debate League's Junior Varsity Video Series. In this video, we will be discussing the counter plan. First, we'll just go over some of the basics, like what is a counter plan and what are the parts of building this argument. Next, we'll talk about some common types of counter plans. We'll go through how to extend a counter plan beyond the first negative speech. And finally, we'll talk about how to answer counter plans when you are the affirmative. So what are we talking about? Well, a counter plan is a proposal by the negative team to take a different action than the plan to achieve the same general goals. They will suggest that their proposal is a better idea and explain why it can't be done at the same time. If a counter plan can be done at the same time as the affirmative, it's not a reason to vote against them. There's no opportunity cost to the plan. It's just a nice idea they can add to their advocacy. This idea is called being mutually exclusive, the inability to do things at the same time. Counterplans, or CPs, are a key part of balanced negative strategies and can be used in com combination with all sorts of other arguments, such as disadvantages, on-case arguments, and even topicality. Counterplans are unique in that they allow the negative to capture or negate affirmative offense, their advantages. If the plan says they can solve global warming and the counter plan says they can solve global warming, nobody gets credit for being able to solve global warming since they can both do the same thing. As always, strategic choices regarding counter plans should be made by the second negative speaker who determine the negative strategy in the block and will eventually have to try and execute the strategy in the 2NR to win the debate. Here are a few things to consider about counter plans before we get started. First is time. Counter plans are pretty quick to read in the first negative constructive, but if you want to win the round on a counter plan in the second negative rebuttal, you're going to have some serious explaining to do in the middle of the debate. Second, counter plans require a net benefit, which is something that makes them better than the affirmative. We'll get more into this concept later, but making the connection between the counter plan and the net benefit is an argument that often gets forgotten and is the key to a successful counterplan strategy. Lastly, running multiple counterplans is possible, but can often get you into hot water with theory arguments from the affirmative. We'll also touch on this later in the video. Let's go and take a bit of a deeper dive into the different parts of a counterplan. They have many common components you should recognize from other types of arguments. They have a text, they have this idea of competition, they have solvency, and they have net benefits. The counter plan needs to have a formal text that remains the same throughout the debate, just like a plan text on the affirmative. I'll say this again. This needs to be a formal text. You can't just say, let's do the plan except X difference. Counter plan texts can of course come in all shapes and sizes. And this can be a great opportunity for you to be creative, especially depending on what the affirmative is talking about. They are also not limited to only taking a single action. So you can have what are called multiple planks or actions in your counter plan. For most counter plans, using some or most of the affirmative text is a good idea, making your objection or difference with the affirmative very clear. Second is this idea of competition or mutual exclusivity. A counter plan is fundamentally a way to determine if the affirmative is a good idea. So if the counter plan and the, and the plan are the same thing, or if the counter plan is just the affirmative plus something else, or if the plan and the counter plan can be done at the same time or in cooperation, they aren't actually reasons why the affirmative are, is bad. They're just other ideas that you had that might be good. To run a counter plan, you have to describe the competition or tension between the two ideas. Identify a trade-off, difference, or other reason why they can't happen together, preferably several reasons. Next is solvency, something you should be familiar about from being affirmative. Counter plans, just like the plan, can't just make assumptions that their ideas are going to work. You have to prove it with evidence. Solvency should answer some of the common questions, just like the affirmative. Who's going to do the proposal? Why are they a good choice? How will it happen? 
When is it going to happen? Who's paying for it? Does the technology or expertise exist to do the counter plan? These are all things you'll need to prove if you're going to go this avenue on the negative. Especially in later speeches, your solvency should focus on how the mechanism of the counter plan can solve the specific advantages of the affirmative. Let's talk about this idea of a net benefit. If a counter plan has a text, reasons why they compete with the affirmative and cannot be done at the same time, and they have a compelling story about how they solve the affirmative harms, the judge is left with an impossible decision. They have two good ideas that re result in the same thing. How could a judge choose between more or less identical proposals? The net benefit is what makes your counter plan better than the affirmative, a reason to vote negative when things are equal. Since counter plans don't often solve quite as well, or at least offer some less certainty than the affirmative, the net benefit can also help outweigh those concerns. The classic net benefit strategy is to find a disadvantage that links to the affirmative plan, but not to the counter plan. Let's look at an example. The plan could say that Congress should pass a law banning discrimination against transgender students in schools. The counter plan would say that the court should rule that discrimination against transgender students is unconstitutional. A disadvantage could argue that if Congress passes a law about transgender students, it would create a backlash in the Republican Congress. The disadvantage thus links to the plan because it goes through Congress, but not the counter plan, since the courts are by definition not Congress. Therefore, doing the counter plan solves the same issue of tr discrimination against transgender students, but it also avoids the political backlash of going through the Congress, giving you a reason to prefer the counter plan over the plan. Let's talk a little bit about normal means. This is an important part of both solvency and competition. Normal means simply refers to what is normal. How are policies normally implemented? Determining normal means can help differentiate between the plan and the counter plan based on who and how they are done. Normal means can also show how solvency works and identify reasons why one method of doing something might be better than another method. Topicality is often useful for enforcing the affirmative to establish normal means. If the violation suggests the affirmative is not topical, the easiest answer for them is to say, yes, we are, here's how. This forces them to be specific about who is doing what, when. Let's use our same example about the Congress, the courts, and discrimination against transgender students to show how normal means can be very important. The plan remains largely the same. The United States federal government should ban discrimination against transgender students in schools. The counter plan remains largely the same. The U.S. Supreme Court should rule that schools cannot discriminate against transgender students. The disadvantage or net benefit to the counter plan remains the same. Congressional action on transgender rights leads to a political backlash. The big difference is that the actor of the plan, the court versus the Congress, are different. However, they're both part of the federal government. If you notice, the plan in this example is slightly less specific. Normal means is likely through an act of Congress, the most common way that government does business, but the affirmative hasn't specified yet. Forcing the affirmative to identify, either in cross-examination or because of a topicality violation, which part of the federal government they use allows this counter plan to be competitive, aka different than the plan. If you don't push them, the affirmative, given the choice after the first negative constructive, will simply say that the courts are the actor they choose to use. They are a part of the federal government after all, and since the negative hasn't defined normal means, they will just say that the counter plan is the plan and have no negative repercussions. This will allow them to dodge the disadvantage and make your counter plan null and void. So now that we've walked through some of the basic components of a counter plan, how do you use one to win a debate? First, let's talk about the first negative constructive. You'll want to keep your counterplan shell to an outline. Make sure to include the following. A carefully written counterplan text 
that is responsive to the specific affirmative you're debating at the time. Second, a competition story. Explain why the counterplan and the plan are mutually exclusive and identify the key differences. Third, solvency. How does the counterplan work and how does it solve the affirmative? And lastly, the net benefit. Why is the counterplan better than the plan? Be sure to clearly identify what arguments make the counterplan net beneficial to the plan and point them out directly to the judge. In the block, it's important to remember to divide and conquer, so only one debater should discuss the counterplan. This is your chance to go in depth, describe why the counterplan is awesome, and win the debate. First, you should restate the story of the counterplan. You don't need to directly quote, but you should be sure to include the counterplan text, explaining why it's different, how the counterplan will work, and why it's better. Make sure to answer any arguments against the counter the competition story, explaining why you can't do both. Extend your solvency evidence from the first negative constructive, making sure to answer any solvency arguments the affirmative makes against you, and read new evidence if you have to. And lastly, extend the net benefit. Why is the counterplan better than the plan from the first negative constructive? Answer any arguments they made against the net benefit, and read new evidence to expand the scope of the benefits. Focus on why the counterplan is better than the plan since they ultimately do the same thing. In the second negative rebuttal, you won't have time to extend every argument from the block, so pick and choose a single strategy to win the debate. If you go for the counterplan, make sure you first answer all the first affirmative rebuttals arguments against you, and then go back through and make sure the judge has a coherent idea of what they're voting for. Explain how the counterplan solves, Explain how the counterplan is better than the plan, the net benefit. Explain how the counterplan interacts with any other arguments that might exist in the debate round. And explain how the net benefit is a big deal. Make sure the judge knows they can vote negative because the net benefit is really, really important, even if the counterplan can't quite solve as well as the affirmative. Lastly, make sure to explain how you can't do the plan and the counterplan at the same time time. The counter plan might start to seem like an imposing negative strategy, but never fear. We'll talk about how to answer the counter plan now. Counter plans are very dangerous for the affirmative. They can capture your entire case and leave you with nothing. However, if you remember the acronym SPOT, you'll come out okay on the other side of the debate. SPOT stands for Solvency, Permutation, Offense, and Theory. First, let's talk about the S, solvency. Many counterplans are designed to answer a wide array of affirmatives, which means they aren't a perfect fit to actually solve any of them. Look for these problems and exploit them. They could be doing an, an actor that is doing something they don't actually do in real life, or a less efficient way to do the plan. Counterplans often haven't happened in real life for a reason. Identify those and explain how their solvency is flawed. Lastly, check to see if the counterplan can solve all or just parts of the affirmative. It helps to have a diverse link story rather than a single action so that the counterplan can't solve all of your advantages. Let's talk about the permutation. A counterplan is a test of whether the affirmative is a good idea, and to do that, they have to be competitive or mutually exclusive, as we've re reviewed earlier. Often, this competition is fake, contrived, or weak. As the affirmative, you have to defend all of the plan, so advocate for a permutation, a position that includes all of the affirmative and all or part of the counterplan. This is you making the fundamental argument, do both. Here are some examples. The 50 states and the federal government should work together to do the plan, or the 50 states should take X and Y action for the establishment of charter schools. If they don't have an answer, you've defeated the counter plan. Next, let's talk about offense. Counter plans offer at least one significant difference between the plan and the counter plan in order to be competitive. These differences should be targeted for offensive reasons why their proposal is bad. Here's an example. 
counter plan. The Supreme Court should, whatever the plan is. Throw some offense out there. The key difference here is that the Supreme Court is the actor versus someone else. Attack the Supreme Court. Their action can never be enforced, and radically overturning a precedent, such as the plan, could destroy the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Counterplans rely on net benefits to make them better than the affirmative, and they often use these to overcome solvency problems. If you turn their net benefits into net negatives, the counterplan not only loses its offense, but becomes a bad idea. Let's stick with this idea about the Supreme Court. If the counterplan is to use the Supreme Court to avoid political backlash, if you can show that the courts will create a greater political backlash, you have defeated the counterplan. Lastly, let's talk about theory. Debating a counterplan as the affirmative is hard. Frankly, they're stealing most of your case. If you can object theoretically to part of a counterplan, do it. Theoretical objections are good offense against counterplans and can be arguments of last resort. So what are some common theoretical objections to counterplans? Well, first, how many did the negative read? Community norms suggest that one counterplan is definitely okay. And two, you could probably get away with. Going for three or more counterplans is downright abusive. Second, some counterplans are more questionable than others, such as consult or condition counterplans. The competition story, the reason why these are mutually exclusive, is often a bit contrived, and they are incredibly similar to the affirmative. Third, conflicting counterplans are definitely objectionable. If you make an answer to one of them, they will use it to support their argument on the other flow. If a team is crushing you all over the flow, but reads a theoretically illegitimate counterplan along the way, forget the case that you've already lost. Go for a Hail Mary and make your 2AR all about theory. The only reason they were beating you, after all, is because they were abusive on their way to it.